live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and Intel, along with its ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back to theCUBE. Our day one coverage of AWS reInvent 19 continues. Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante. Dave and I have a couple of guests we'd like you to welcome. We've got Anthony Brooks-Williams, the CEO of HBR, back Thank on theCUBE, your you. alumni. We should Thank get you a you. pin. Thank you, uh, yes please. And Snowflake alumni, but Chris, you're new. Chris Dagnan, Chief Revenue Officer from Snowflake. Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you, excited to be here. All right guys, so even though both companies have been on before, Anthony, let's start with you. Give our audience a refresher about HVR, who you guys are, what you do. Sure, so we're in the data integration space, particularly a real-time data integration, so we move data to the cloud in the, in the most efficient way, and we make sure it's secure and it's accurate, and we move it into environments such as Snowflake. Um, and that's where we've got some really good customers that we're happy to talk about joint customers that we're doing together, but Chris can tell us a little bit about Snowflake. Sure, and Snowflake is a cloud data warehousing company. We are cloud native, we, we are on AWS, we're on GCP, and we're on Azure. And uh, you know, if you look at the competitive landscape, we compete with uh, our friends at Amazon, we compete with our friends at Microsoft, and our friends at Google. <laughs> so it's su a super interesting place to, to be, but uh, it, very exciting at the same time, and, and su super excited to partner with Anthony. And, and it, it's some others who aren't really your friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct, <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if we could start by just sure. talking about you know, the, the data warehouse sort of trends that you guys see. When I talked to practitioners in the old days, they used to say to me things like, oh, infrastructure management, it's such a nightmare, it's like a snake swallowing a basketball. Every time Intel comes out with a new chips, we chase it because we just need more performance and we can't yeah. get our jobs done fast enough. And there's only three, every, there's three guys that we got to go through to get any answers. And it was just, never really lived up to the promise of 360 degree view of your business and real time analytics. Yeah. How has that changed? Well, there's that, I mean, obviously the cloud has had a big difference on that elasticity. Um, what you would find is in, in, in yesterday, customers have these, a retail customer, has these big events twice a year. And so to do an analysis on what's being sold on customers' transactions, they buy this big data warehouse environment for two events a year, typically. And so what's happened, and that's highly, cost, highly costly, as we know, to maintain, and then because of the advances in technology and chips and stuff. And then you move into this cloud world, which gives you that elasticity of scale up, scale down as you need to, and then particular where we've got to now is Snowflake that is built for that environment and that elasticity, and so you get someone like us that can move this data at today's scale and volume through these techniques we have into an environment that then bleeds into helping them solve the challenges you talk about of, of yes, you have these big clunky environments, let's say. Yeah, I think you, I think you kind of nailed it. I think like early days, so our, our founders are from Oracle and they were building Oracle 8i, 9i, 10g and when I interviewed them, I was the first sales rep showing up in day one, I'm like, what the heck am I selling? And when I met them, I said, tell me what the benefit of Snowflake is. And they're like, well, at Oracle, when we'd go talk to customers and they'd say, Oracle's, a, you know, I have this problem with Oracle, they'd say, hey, that's, you know, on seven generations ago, Oracle, you haven't upgraded the latest code. So one of the things they talked about is being a service. Hey, we want to make it really easy. You never have to upgrade the service. And then, to, to your point around, you have a fixed amount of resources on premise, so you can't, all of a sudden, if you have a new project that you want to bring on, the first question I asked when I started at Snowflake to customers was, how long does it take you to kick off a, new, a net new workload onto your Teradata, onto your Vertica? And it'd take them nine to 12 months, because they'd have to go procure the new hardware, install it, and yeah. guess what, with Snowflake, you can make an instantaneous decision, and because of our elasticity, because of the benefits of our partner from Amazon, you can really you know, grow with your demand of your business. Yep. So businesses, many, don't have the luxury of nine to 12 months anymore, Chris. That's correct. Because, we all know, if, if an enterprise legacy business isn't thinking, there's somebody not far behind me who has the elasticity, who yep. has the appetite, who's, who understands the opportunity that cloud provides. If you're not thinking that, as Andy Jassy will say, you're going to be on the wrong end of that equation. But, for large enterprises, that's hard, that the whole change culture is very hard to do. I'd love to get your perspective, Chris, on what you're seeing in terms of industries shifting their mindsets to understand the value that 
they could unlock with this data, but how are big industries, legacy industries, changing? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that, look, we were chasing AMA, we were chasing the cloud providers early days. So five years ago, we are selling to ad tech and online gaming companies. Today, what's happened in the industry is, and I'll give you a perfect example, is Benoit and I, one of our founders, went out to one of the largest investment banks on Wall Street five years ago, and they said, and they have more money than God, and they say, hey, we love what you've built, we love, when are you going to run on premise? And ben Benoit you know, uttered this phrase of, hey, you will run on the public cloud before we ever run in the private cloud. And guess what, he was a truth teller because five years from, uh, you know, later, they are one of our largest customers today and they made the decision to move to the cloud and we're seeing financial services at a, blistering pace move to the cloud, and that's where you know, partnering with, with a, you know, folks from HVR is, is super important for us because we don't have the ability to just magically have this data appear in the cloud, and that's where we rely quite heavily on, yeah. on Anthony. So Anthony, in, in the financial services world in particular, it used to be cloud, never, that was yeah. an evil word. Automation, no, we have to have full control, and then migration, never. Yeah. Digital transformation has started to change those sure. things. It's really become an imperative, but it's but migration in particular is really challenging. So yeah. I wonder if we could dig into that a little bit and sure. help us understand how you solve that problem. Yeah, so customers, they want to adopt some of these technologies, so there's the migration route. They may want to go adopt some of these, these cloud databases, the cloud data warehouses, and so we have some areas where we, you know, we can do that and keep the business up and running at the same time. So the techniques we use, are we reading the transaction logs of the databases, uh, something called CDC, and so there'll be initial transfer of the bulk of the data, initial instantiation or refresh. At that same time, we capturing data out of the transaction logs while that system's live and doing a migration to their new environment. Or into Snowflake's world, capturing data where it's happening, where the data is generated, and moving that real time, securely, accurately, into this environment for someone like 1-800-Flowers, where they can do this, make better decisions to serve their customers better at point of sale. So all their business divisions pulling it in. So there's the migration aspects, and then there's the, the use case around the, the real time reporting as well. So you're essentially refueling the plane while, while you're in midair. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that's a so, good one. So, so what does the customer see? How disruptive is it? How do you minimize that disruption? Well, the good thing is, well, we've all got these experienced teams, like uh, Chris said, that have been around the block, and a lot of ours have done this, what we do, we're at HVR for the last 15 years, that companies like Golden Gate that we sold to Oracle and those things. And so there's a whole consultative approach to them versus just, here's some software, good luck with it. So there's that aspect where there's a lot of planning that goes into that and then through that, using our technologies that are well suited to this, able to ensure some good success. And it's a key focus for us, and in our world, in this subscription-based SaaS type world, customer success is key, and so we have to build a lot of that into how we make those successful as well. I think it's a barrier to entry, like going, going from on-premise to the cloud, that's the number one pushback that we get when we go out and say, hey, we have a cloud-native data warehouse, like how the heck are we going to get the data to the cloud? And that's where you know, a partnership with, with, with HVR is super important. Yeah. What are some of the things that you guys encounter? Because we, many businesses live in the multi-cloud world. Most of the time, not by strategy, right? A lot of CIOs say, well, we sort of inherited this. Yeah. Or it's M&A, or it's developers that have preference. How do you help customers move data appropriately based on the value, that the perceived value that it can, can give? in what is really a multi-world today. Chris, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think, so, so as we go into customers, I think the, the biggest hurdle for them to move to the cloud is security, because they think yeah. the cloud is not secure. So, you know, if, we, if you look at our engagement with customers, we go in and we actually have to sell the value of Snowflake, and then they say, well, okay, great, go talk to the security team. And then we talk to the security team and say, hey, let me show you how we secure data, and then, and then they have to get comfortable around how they're going to actually move, get the data from on-premise to the cloud, and that's, again, when we engage with partners like HVR, so, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we go through a whole process with the customer. Typically, there's a, taking some of that data in a, in a POC-type environment and proving that out as, before it gets rolled out, and, a lot of you know, references and case studies around it as well. And it depends on the customer. You have some customers who are bold, yeah. and it doesn't matter the size. We have a Fortune 100 customer who literally had an on-premise Teradata system that they moved from on-premise on -prem, from on Teradata to Snowflake in 111 days because they were all in. You have other yeah. customers that say, hey, I'm, I'm going to take it easy, I'm going to workload by workload, and it just depends, and the mileage may vary, is, is what so I said. Like, so can you give us an example of, like, uh, uh, maybe a customer example, or in what workloads they moved, was it reporting, what other types, yeah. was it analytics? Oh so, yeah, we got a couple, I mean, we could talk a little bit about 1-800-Flowers, we could talk about something like 
Pitney Bowes, where they were moving from Oracle to SQL Server. It's a bunch of SAP data sitting in SAP uh, ECC, so there's some complexity around how you acquire, how you decode that, that data, which we have a, a unique ability to do, where we can decode the cluster and pool tables, coupled with our CDC technique, and they had some stringent performance loads um, that a, a bunch of other vendors uh, couldn't meet the needs between both our companies, and so we were able to solve that challenge for them jointly and move this data at scale in the performance that they needed out of these Oracle SQL Server environments into, into Snowflake. People will all, almost feel like S, when you have an SAP environment, it's almost stuck in SAP. So to get it out is like, it's scary, right? Yeah. And, and this is where it's super awesome for us to, to do work like this. Yeah. On that front, I wanted to understand your thoughts on transformation. It's a word, it's a theme of yeah. reInvent 2019. It's a word that we hear at every event, whether we're talking about digital transformation, workforce, IT, et cetera. But one of the things that Andy Jassy said this morning was that got to start, it's, it's, this is more than technology, right? Yep. This, the next gen cloud is more than technology, it's about getting those senior leaders on board. Chris, your perspective, looking at financial services for a second, we were really surprised at how quickly they've been able to move, understanding, presumably, that if they don't, there's going to be other businesses. But are you seeing that as the chief revenue officer? Are your conversations starting at that CEO level? Yeah, it, it kind of has to. It, like, and the reason why, if you do a bottoms up approach and say, hey, I've, I've got a great technology and you sell this great technology to you know, a tech person, the reality is unless the CEO, CIO, or CTO has an initiative to do digital transformation and move to the cloud, you'll die. You'll die in security, you'll die in legal. Lawyers love to kill deals, and, and so those are the two areas that I see de deals you know, slow down significantly, and that's where you know, we, it's, it's getting through those processes and, and finding the champion at the CEO level, CIO level, CTO level. If, yeah. you're, if you're a modern day CIO and you do not have a, a cloud strategy, you're probably going to get replaced in 18 months. So you, know, you better get on board and you better take, you know, take yeah. advantage of what's happening in the industry. And I think that coupled with the fact that in, in today's world, you mean you said there's a, it gets thrown around as a, as a theme and particularly the last couple of years, I think it's, it's now it is actually a strategy and, and reality because what you also find is that there's as many IT tech savvy people sit in the business side of organizations today that used to sit in legacy IT and I think it's that coupled with the, the, the leadership driving it that's, that's demanding it. They're demanding to be able to access that certain type of data in a geo to make decisions that affect the business right now. I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about some of the innovations that are coming out. I mean, I've been really hard on data, the data warehouse industry. Yeah. You can tell I'm jaded, I've been around a long time. I mean, I've always said that, that, that Sarbanes-Oxley saved old school BI and, and data oh. warehousing and because of you know, all the reporting requirements. And again, that business never lived up to its promises. Um, but it seems like there's this whole new set of workloads emerging in the cloud where you, you take a, a data warehouse like, like a Snowflake you maybe bring in some ML tools, maybe it's Databricks or whatever, HVR helping you sort of virtualize the, the data. Yeah. And people are, are driving new workloads that are, that are bringing insights that they couldn't get before in near real time. What are you seeing in terms of some of those gestalt trends uh, and how are companies taking advantage of these innovations? Well, I think one, there's just the general proliferation of data. There's just more data and like you're saying, from many different sources, so they capture data, from CNC machines in factories, you know, like, like we do for someone like GE, um, that type of data is to data, financial data that's sitting in a BU, taking all of that and going, there's just this vast sum of data, how can we get a total view of our business and at a board level make better decisions and that's where they go put it in a snowflake in this elastic environment that allows them to do this consolidated view of that whole organization. But I think it's largely been driven by things are digitized, there's sensors on everything, and there's just a sheer volume of data. I think all of that coming together is what's, what's driven it. Is, is data access, uh, you know, we talked about security a little bit, but, but who has rights to access the data? Is that a challenge? How are you guys solving that? Or is it? Uh, I mean, I think it's like anything, like once people start to understand how a data, we're, we're an acid compliant, uh, date SQL so, database, so we, whatever yeah. your security you use on your on-premise, you can use the same on Snowflake. It's just a misperception that the industry has that being on, on in a data center is more secure than being in the cloud, and it's actually wrong. 
I guess my question is not so much security of the cloud. Yeah. It's more what, what you were saying about the disparate data sources. They're coming yeah. in hard and fast now. Yeah. And, and, and how do you keep track of who has access to the, to the data? I mean, is it another security tool or is it a partnership with, you know, some well, ab Absolutely, I mean, company? so there's also, the, there's, in financial data, there's certain geos. Data can't leave certain geos, whether it be in the EU yeah, right. or a certain companies, particularly these, in these GDPR, big banks. So, now California. So there's, there's, there's stuff that we can do from a security perspective in the data that we move that's, that's secure, it's encrypted. If we capture data from multiple different source systems, we have, the, we have the ability to take it all through one, one proxy in the firewall, which just, it, oh. it helps them a lot in, in that aspect, something unique in our right. technology. But then there's other tools that they have, and uh, uh, largely you sit down with them and it, it's their sort of governance that they have in the, in the organization to go, how do they tackle that and the rules they set around it, you know? So, last question I have is, so we're seeing, you know, I look at the spending data and my, my breaking analysis, go on my LinkedIn, you'll see it. Uh, Snowflake's off the charts. It's up there with, with robotic process automation, and obviously Redshift very strong. Do you, do you see those two, I think you addressed it before, but I'd love to get you on record, it's sort of coexisting and thriving. Really, that's not the enemy, right? It's the, it's the Teradatas right. and the IBMs yeah. and the Oracles of the yeah, world. Yeah, I mean, I think, Look, uh, you know, Amazon, uh, our relationship with Amazon is like a, you know, a 20 year marriage, right? Sometimes there's good days, sometimes there's bad days. And I think, uh, you know, every year about this time, you know, we get a, a, a bat phone call from someone at Amazon saying, hey, you know, the Redshift team's coming out with a snowflake killer. And I've heard that literally for six years now. Um, turns out that there's an opportunity for us to coexist. Turns out there's an opportunity for us to compete. Um, and, and it's all about how they handle themselves as a business. Amazon has been tremendous in separation of that, of okay, we're going to partner here, we're going to compete here, and we're okay if you guys beat us. And, and so that's how they operate. But yes, it is complex, and it's, it's, there are challenges to well, that. Well, the marketplace yeah. guys must love you, though, because you're selling a lot of compute. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. The, S, the S3 guys, yeah. I mean, they love it. I mean, we, we have a similar thing. I mean, well, AWS have a, a technology called DMS, the Data Migration Service. Yeah, right, sure. Yet they work with us, they refer opportunities to us when it's these big enterprises that are use cases, scale, complexity, volume of data. That's what we do. We're not necessarily into the, the smaller mom and pop type shops that just want to adopt it, and I think that's where we all both able to coexist co together. There's more than enough. All You're of right. Us. You're yeah. right. It's like it's like, hey, we have champions in the S3 group, the EC2 uh, group, the private link group. You know, across all of the Amazon products. So there's a lot of friends of ours. Yeah, the Redshift team doesn't like us, but that's okay. I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> Healthy competition. But it just goes to show that not only do customers and partners have choice, but they're exercising it. Gentlemen, thank you Absolutely. for joining Dave and me on the Cube this afternoon. We appreciate your time. Thank Thanks you for having all us. Right. Thank pleasure. You. Thanks. Our thank pleasure. You. For Dave Vellante, I am Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE from day one of our coverage of AWS reInvent 19. Thanks for watching. <laughs>